Okay. Thank you for your wonderful talk. <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions? I have one. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, go ahead. No, go ahead, Liz. Let's start with James and let's start with Liz. First, first James. I was wondering if you could talk about the significance of the seating arrangement in the Dharma room. It, it seems like uh, you know, you kind of are sitting in front of the, the Buddha statue and then the person to the side has the stick. And then it seems like the person to the other side is maybe leading. Okay, wait, we have, I sit in the back facing mm -hmm. the altar and I sit in the center because I'm the guiding teacher. And next to me is the other teacher here who happens to be my husband. And if we have a visiting teacher, they'll sit. So the teachers sit in the center of the back row and that's like people who are like fully authorized, like Judo Popes and Nims or Zen Masters. And then the person hitting the stick sits to the right of the altar, and the person hitting the, um, leading the chanting sits to the left of the altar, and that's because then they're seen by everybody else in the Dharma room, which is good because they're the people you have to pay attention to. And then other than that, we don't have strict rules. Some places, only people who've taken a certain number of precepts can sit in certain places, but we like to mix and match. So if you're inexperienced, you hopefully will find yourself sitting next to someone experienced who can help you. But the significance is there really isn't any significance. <laughs> it's just practical. It's just okay. really practical. Yeah. You want to be able to be aware of the person stopping and ending sitting, you want to be aware of the person leading chanting, okay? Although when we have hybrid practice and it's not on the weekend, then the people starting and ending sitting are actually on Zoom and we don't have the um, projector set up because it's just too much trouble. And so that means we can't see the people who are starting and ending practice. In fact, we have to hope that they showed up so, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some places are very serious about it. Like, you know, the, when you took your precepts determines the seating order and it's very, very serious, but we're much more relaxed about it because ultimately we're all students of the Dharma. Just some of us have certain jobs. You know, the title comes with a job. It's not like the it's not like the Queen of England where you have this useless job or the King of England. I really feel sorry. For, I mean, I feel so sorry for those people. They don't have a life, you know? I mean, suppose you're a wonderful musician or a wonderful artist or you really want to be a wonderful gardener or a cook and you're like royalty. You can't do that. You've got to like, you know, put bottles of, of, um, of, um, of champagne on ships and, you know, like talk at kindergartens and I don't know what, you know, you can't really live a life and everybody's paying attention to you and you can't go out your door without the, I mean, it's horrible, but we're not like that. So <laughs> luckily, yeah. So thank you very much for your question. Um, Liz, you had a question. Yes, my question is um, about uh, chanting practice. Yes. So, so um, you know, at first I was, just, uh, you know, you, you just chant, you know, and you follow mm -hmm. you just chant, and that's chanting practice. But, but lately I've been, um, you know, I've heard, and I heard this in Soto Zen as well as, as here mm -hmm. that, you know, you actually chant with your ears. Mm -hmm. you know, it's listening. You mm -hmm. Listen. Okay. So then I've been um, thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't rely on the book to chant. Maybe I should uh, uh, listen to the chant and, and not rely on on reading it as I chant, um, which sometimes goes not so well, <laughs> especially like if it's the uh, the great Durrani, you know, um, mm -hmm. it, it, I require the the words to really chant. To, which to, which I should explain is a long mantra, so it has no meaning, so it's really hard. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and so then I think, well, does it matter whether I read? 
the, the book when I chant? Do, should I make an effort, a real concerted effort? Which memorizing something long like that would be difficult for me. But, mm -hmm. you know, is it difficult because I say it's difficult? Or should I just really work at trying to do something like that? So what's the merit of memorizing the chants um, to really practice chanting meditation? Should you strive not to use the book? Should you use the book? So anytime anyone asks a question about merit, there's always one answer. No merit, right? So Bodhidharma was brought to the Emperor Wu because he was this famous monk from India. And the Emperor Wu was, I have built many temples, many stupas. I have supported many monks. And maybe he even mentioned nuns. I have, you know, um, I have paid for people to translate the sutras, and I have had sent them all around my empire. How much merit have I attained? And Bodhidharma said, no merit. So it's really important. So there's no merit. So don't worry about merit, OK? So some people have really good memories. And some people, like me, have really bad memories. And the point is, when you chant, you want to 100% chant and you want 100% listen to everyone chanting. Your chanting and their chanting is not separate. So that's the point of chanting. And even if you're chanting alone, you're still listening. It's kind of a weird thing. You're still listening. And in some sense, you're not really listening to yourself. You're listening as well as chanting. And it all comes together. If it helps to have the book, that's fine. If you remember the chants, that's fine. There is one half page in the Thousand Eyes and Hands Sutra that I still don't have memorized. And if there are not enough people in the room when I'm chanting it that I can just sort of tag along, <laughs> I have the book open in front of me. And some people here have seen that. I have the book open in front of me. And you know, I always lead that chant. And you know, I'm hitting the muktak, And then all of a sudden, I'll go like this. And that means <laughs> I've reached the part of the chant that I don't remember. And I, have, and, you know, I don't have my glasses on usually, so I have to get really close to it. So it doesn't matter whether you have them memorized or not. What matters is that you're giving it 100% of your effort, not in the sense of shouting out the chants, but in the sense of coming together. You know, you're chanting, yes, with your ears, with your mouth, with your throat, with your chan chan. You know, all your chanting should always come from your center. The Zen Master Sung San was an amazing chanter. If you ever run across, and you can, I'm sure it's on YouTube, um, uh, tapes of his chanting the bell chant, either of the bell chants, it's just amazing. And the reason it's amazing is because it's coming from his chan chan, you know, this, this part here, you know. Bunjong song. Bunedan, like that, you know? You chant like that. You chant from there. You don't chant from here. You know, you don't say, Bunjong, not like that. It's, it's coming from this deep, deep place. So that's chanting. And whether you are looking at the words or you're not looking at the words, that's not really important. And most people find that as they keep chanting, gradually they naturally remember more and more of it. And for some people it's faster and some people it's slower. And one of these days I have to sit down for, you know, an hour or so and take that half page in the Thousand Eyes and Ants Sutra and just memorize the damn thing. <laughs> but I somehow never get around to it. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I think Stan had a question. I think he had a Bodhisattva question. <laughs> You didn't hear that. So bodhisattva question is, um, that means that um, you're asking a question to sort of fill in the blank, and you think it's a question that might help somebody. And so you ask this question. But it's not, you don't really have that question. In fact, you can probably answer that question better than the person you're asking. But you know, you just kind of want to. Actually, I was still going to ask the question about chanting. Oh. Uh, can you talk about chanting really as listening? The name of our school is, after all, Kwan Ong, the key 
clear. Uh, okay, uh, so, okay, so I, I have to repeat his question because it doesn't come across on Zoom because you don't have a microphone. Um, so the question is, could I please talk about chanting as listening? Because the name of our school is Kwan Um, which means, um, it's really Kwan Se Um is the name of the Bodhisattva, which means hear the sound of the world, hear world sound. So Kwan Um means um, hear sound, hear the world. Um, and so you just answered yourself, answered your question by your comment about it. Yeah, so our school means we listen to the sound of the world. And the sound of the world is suffering. I mean, there are other sounds too. Like we can hear the kids clomping around upstairs. <laughs> and hopefully they're not suffering. Um, but, you know, that's the first of the three marks of existence is dukkha, which we translate as suffering, which is not quite correct, but it's close. Um, so, yeah, there's dissatisfaction. Things are hard. And it's hard to, um, it's hard to live with them and it's hard to know what to do. So we listen. Listening when we're chanting is, um, it's not focused on the suffering. What listening when we're chanting is focused on we are not separate. We are not separate in this world. If you've ever um, been in a, a really serious choir or chorus, you know, whether it's in school or church or, you know, something, a really serious choir, you know that much of it, you really have to listen to each other because you're harmonizing with each other. You know, I love to harmonize. People don't like me to harmonize in the Dharma room because it, you know, it messes people up. They're not sure what the tune is. But the whole thing about harmony, when you're singing harmony, you really have to listen. You have to listen to the subtlest changes in pitch because, you know, people tend to sort of slide down. You have to be really aware of that because, and you, you have to see how it fits in together. So even if we're singing in unison, you have to really see how it fits together and you're not separate. You're not standing off to one side. You're really coming together with everybody. So that's the spirit of listening when you're chanting. It's really listening. And then when you go out in this world, you really listen. You know, I remember when, um, when I was in college and I, um, this was back when we didn't, way back, we didn't even dream of cell phones back then. Um, and uh, I was supposed to meet my boyfriend in Manhattan and I was supposed to take the, the um, New Haven Railroad in. And um, I had read the schedule wrong and it turned out that the train I wanted, told him I'd be on didn't run on Saturday or Sunday, whatever day of the weekend it was. And I couldn't contact him. And I was just frantic. I couldn't contact my boyfriend, you know. And, and, and I, I wasn't going to be able to be in the city for like hours. And, you know, I was just frantic. And finally, I, I, you know, I called his dormitory because, you know, the dorms would have like one phone or maybe one phone in each hallway. And I managed to reach his roommate. And I said, I told him this. I said, you know, you got to, you know, you got to tell Les I can't come in, you know. I, this, the train doesn't exist. I can't come in for like four hours. And, and, and this guy said, don't worry. The sun is shining. And that's not listening. <laughs> you know, he was not listening, right? So don't be like that. So listening really means listening. Not projecting your own ideas, your own um, advice, your own whatever. Not projecting that. It means really seeing this person in front of you, you know, listening, seeing they're not separate, really being aware of who is in front of you and what their situation is. That's what listening is about. It's about not being shut up in this thing here, you know, just all enclosed and, 
nobody can get in and you can't get out, you know. So does that answer your question? Yeah. You're welcome. So I, I, there is something I wanted to say. Um, there's just a couple of minutes. I had one of those weird medical procedures that you don't want to talk about. Um, some people here know what it was this week. And it was a very wonderful thing because it was extraordinarily uncomfortable. And the whole prep plus procedure lasted like a day and a half, you know. And, um, and at one point, you know, just before the procedure, I'm, you know, I'm lying there and they've given me some kind of tranquilizer you know, through the IV and then they're about to give me the, um, the anesthetic to knock me out completely. And I just realized that I had no idea who I was in the sense of my idea of who I am, this person of agency, this person who's in control, this person who knows what she's doing, you know, that person wasn't there. I was completely at the mercy of whoever was there. And I was at the mercy of my body. And we're all like that. That is our situation. And we never want to face it. We all want to think that we're in charge. And we all want to think that, you know, we can control things. And we all want to think that our body is going to work with the way we want our body to work forever. And it was just an amazing thing to say, oh, no, <laughs> that's not what it's like. You know, and it wasn't like, oh, this is horrible, because that's just our situation. It's so provisional. It's just completely provisional. And it's completely made up. You know, the stories we tell about ourselves are completely made up. And we need them. You know, there's a reason why people like the moth and they like all these stories, because stories, we're humans. You know, stories sort of help us know how to live. They're wonderful. They're all metaphors. They're all metaphors. They're wonderful metaphors. But we hold on to them a lot of the time. And we mistake them for what's real. So I just want to encourage everyone, when you find yourself in those situations where things are not going the way you, want, you expect them to go or want them to go, when you have lost control of the situation, when you're at the mercy of your body, when you're at the mercy of others, when um, your body fails, which eventually all of our bodies fail, you know, use that. Welcome it. It's a chance to truly awaken. So don't feel sorry for yourself. Just go like, oh yeah, that's what it's like. So thank you. Brandon, just stop. <laughs>